It is a part of the wonder of Christmas in how God chose to reveal Himself in the promises that would overcome the devil and the personification in Genesis chapter 3 that we see in the story of the disobedience of Adam and Eve through the enticement of the serpent as a personification of Satan. We needed hope. You've heard about the hundreds of prophecies that God gave to us promising that that hope would come. The prophecies that Jesus would be born. 300 of them is what they told us in the reading that we heard just a moment ago. I want to do something a little interesting this morning. I'd like to do a little quiz, a little true and false quiz with you. Are you up to this? I'd like to do a little true and false quiz over the prophecies of the Old Testament that predicted the coming of Jesus. So I'm going to read a prophecy or not a prophecy, and I want you to tell me, is it true or is it false? Here's the first one. What do you think? That the Messiah would come from a woman and crush the head of the serpent, which is the devil and Satan. True or false? It is true. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. I'll put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers, and he will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. Number two. Messiah would come for all nations. True or false? True. It is true. Genesis chapter 12, God said to Abraham when he said, I'm going to make a great nation out of you and all of the nations will be blessed by you and those who bless you will be blessed and those who curse you will be cursed and all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. That was the prophecy. Number three, Messiah, when he's born, would have curly hair. True or false? False? Are you sure? It is false. We're not told what kind of hair he would have in the scriptures. Number, th- number four, Messiah, when he comes, would come and appear as a space alien from another planet. Are you sure? There are some people who think that. It's false. The scripture doesn't tell us that he would be that at all. Number five, Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. True or false? We know that to be true. Micah 5, 2 said, But you, Bethlehem, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come from me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old and ancient times. Interesting that Micah told us the story about that. Here's the next one, true or false. Messiah would go to live in Egypt when he was young, and then he would come back from Egypt. True or false? True. Hosea the prophet said, When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I have called my son. Here's the next one. The Messiah would be like a star and a branch. True or false? It's true. Jeremiah, or rather Isaiah, tells us that there would be one who rises like a star, and the Messiah would be like a branch that shoots out of a stump. And it would be glorious. The next one is this. Messiah would trigger a mass murder of young children. True or false? There was one of you. True? It is true. Jeremiah prophesied that the voice heard in Ramah would be mourning and great weeping. Rachel would be reaping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. It foretold the murder and the the genocide of children under Herod the Great. Here's the next one. Messiah would, as a child, play with snakes and not get bit. True or false? And think about that one, didn't you? 
It's false. There are other literature in the second century that says this, but they're not biblical letters or biblical books. Uh, the next one, Messiah's birth would include signs in the constellations as a star that would rise up and a scepter in the constellations. True or false? It's true. Clear back to the book of Numbers. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star will come out of Jacob, and a scepter will rise out of Israel. If you know anything about astronomy, it's a fascinating study to watch what was taking place at the coming of the birth of the child in astronomy. The star and a scepter. Messiah, the next one, Messiah would be born of a virgin and called Emmanuel. True? It is. We heard it this morning, Isaiah 17. Now there is this prophecy I want us to focus on this morning, and that that's the one. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign, and behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel. Now we have that verse, we have that prophecy. But there's a whole backstory to this story and this prophecy and the promise of hope because the promise and the prophecy came at a time in Israel's existence in which there was very little hope. In fact, there was great dilemma. There was great danger. There was great difficulty that they were facing as a people and as a nation. And the signs that God had given to them prior to this were fading in their memories. They needed a new sign. They needed a new hope. And so we begin to understand that when Isaiah gave this prophecy, it was nearly 800 years before Christ. It would be 2,800 years from where we stand today. 2,800 years ago, there were the tribe, two tribes that had come together out of the 12, and they had split. The kingdom of Israel, the nation of Israel, had split into a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. The southern kingdom was named after one of the tribes that split. It was the tribe of Judah. And the northern kingdoms had the other ten tribes that had split off from that direction in their lives. And they had two kings. There was a man, a man by the name of Ahaz in the southern kingdom. And there was a man by the name of Pekin in, or Pekah in the northern kingdom. I don't know if you can relate to this. I'm sure your family, you could never relate to this. You've never had any fights. You've never had any division. Your family's never had any feuds. They all get along perfectly, right? Yeah. No? Then you can relate. You can relate to these, to these tribes of Israel that no longer got along with their siblings anymore. And so they had created a difficulty and had separated over the period of time. Now in this moment of history that Isaiah was speaking into, Pekah, who was in the northern kingdom, had become friends with a pagan king by the name of Rezin of the kingdom of Syria that was just to the north of him. And those two guys became friends and they decided to gang up on Ahaz and the southern kingdom of Judah and they wanted nothing more than to obliterate Judah and get rid of Ahaz so they could build their empire around that. Kind of like having an older brother who gets with his friends and beats up on you. You ever had that experience in your life? I never did because I was the oldest child. I was the conspirator. <laughs> Working on the younger siblings. And so here it is that, 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 that Pekka and Rezin are coming together against Ahaz. And in chapter 7, if you read the context, the news had come to the royal court of Judah that Syria is allied with Israel, the brothers, the sisters of Judah. And so the hearts of the king, the Bible says, and his people trembled with fear like trees shaking in the storm. It kind of reads like a panic story. It, it kind of reads like the alarm bells are going off, like the warning signals are taking place. And about this time, when Isaiah heard about what was happening at the palace, he was told by God, I want you to go have a meeting with Ahaz, and I want you to tell him some things. Take your son, whose name means the remnant who will return. 
Take your son and go tell him that all of the threats he's hearing from the north, all of the conspiracies he's hearing from the north, all of the news he's getting from the north about what's happening, all the military strategists who are giving him information, none of that is going to happen. Tell him that God knows that they're going to try and there's lots of reasons to be afraid. And there's lots of reasons to panic, but I'm telling you, Ahaz, the Lord says, it's not going to happen. For Syria is no longer, it's no stronger than its capital, Damascus. Israel is no stronger than its capital, Samaria. And then God says through Isaiah the prophet to Ahaz, something that becomes true for every one of us this morning in our lives. When God begins to talk to us about the decisions and the dilemmas that we're facing in our lives, then Isaiah says to Ahaz, unless you stand in your faith, I cannot make you Stand firm. Listen to that. Unless you stand in your faith, what I've just told you is from God, then I can't, the prophet says, I can't make you stand firm. So God goes, tells, God tells Isaiah, Isaiah tells Ahaz. And then a few weeks passed and Ahaz showed no signs of believing that that Isaiah had told him the truth. He's listening to more news reports. He's listening to his strategy advisors. He's listened to his political advisors. He's listening to all of the news around him. He's hearing the threats. He's getting the emails and the letters from the north. and, And he's being threatened at every turn. And so Isaiah goes back. God says, go back to Ahaz and say, you're looking to the wrong places. You're looking for the wrong allies. You're looking to believe the wrong people in this mess and you need to listen to me. So here to prove it, I'm going to ask you, you ask me, he says to Ahaz, you ask me God for a sign. Ask anything you want, as high as the heavens, as low as the earth, ask for anything you want. And I'll do it to prove to you that I'm speaking the truth, that what you're facing and what you're afraid of, you don't have to be afraid of. But Ahaz got all spiritual. And the scripture says that when he went there, he said, but the king refused and wouldn't ask God for a sign as instructed. In fact, what he said to God was, I wouldn't dare do that. I'm not going to test the Lord like that. Let it happen like you want it to happen, but, but I'm not going to put myself out on the line. I'm not going to test it and ask you for a sign. That, in fact, the Bible says, and he begins to quote scripture, you shall not test the Lord your God. And then God says to Isaiah, will you try the patience of human beings? And Isaiah is about fed up with Ahaz by now. And, and he says to Ahaz, he said, you're trying the very patience of the human beings. Will you even try the patience of God? And then God says to him, all right, you won't ask for a sign. I'm going to give you my own sign. And here's the sign. I will give you. The virgin will conceive a child. She'll give birth to a son and you'll call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And by the time this child is old enough to choose what is right and reject what is wrong, and he will be eating yogurt and honey. And this child, before he is old enough to eat the yogurt and honey, all of the kings, that the two kings that you're fearing today will no longer be in existence. Both of them will be dead and gone. Now that's an interesting promise because God was promising to Ahaz that he was going to be with him in his dilemma. And God basically tells him here the sign, the sign of a child. But it's not only a big deal about this child. I want you to notice something else about this. Because if you go into chapter 8, this dialogue with God continues. And Isaiah goes back another time to Ahaz trying to talk him in to believing what God has told him and not to react and act as he shouldn't act with the enemies surrounding him. And so he comes again and he says to Ahaz, 
God says to Ahaz, you know, I've put you by the little river of Shiloh. It's a peaceful place. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He leads me beside still waters. I've put you by a little stream. I've put you by this place and I've dealt with you in gentleness. But you don't respond to my gentleness. You don't respond to the little stream of peaceful waters I've given to you. So because you won't respond to the peaceful place where I've given to you. And you won't believe me. I'm going to let the Euphrates River to the north of you. In the, in the, in the symbol of the king of Syria. Assyria is going to come rushing in in a flood. And take over your land. Because you won't believe me. You don't want the. I, I don't know about you folks. But I pray often, Lord, would it be all right that I could respond to your gentle direction and not have to have the hard way, the difficult way, the flood that just rolls over you till you finally get the message? Can, can my heart be so turned, turned to you that I live with David the shepherd in the still waters and he restores my soul and he leads me in the paths of righteousness or as I read this week and, and, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever and he'll lead me in the paths of mercy and righteousness. That's where God wants to lead us but if we won't respond to that often he has to bring the river. Here's Ahaz, God says to him, I'll bring the river. And by this time, Isaiah is getting a little frustrated. And he's begging Ahaz, preserve the teaching of God. Entrust instructions. I will wait for the Lord who has turned from the descendants, but I will put my hope in him. And then somebody came along in this mix up and said, let's go check out with the astrologers. Let's go check our horoscopes. Let's go check with the medium spirits. Let's check out the new age. You can read it there in verse 19. In fact, let's go, let's go to the temples and pray to the dead saints. That they'll help us in our great time. I mean, let's just go pray to the saints. Let's go pray to our ancestors. And God spoke up again and said, Are you going to listen to the whisperings and the mutterings of the dead and to spiritists and to the New Age movement? Should not a people ask God for guidance? Shouldn't the living seek guidance from the, from the dead? Look to God's instructions and teachings because the people who contradict His word are completely in the dark. And then God makes another prediction. He says, what's going to happen is if you keep listening to them, what you're going to have is you're going to have a whole nation who becomes stressed out, freaked out, weary, and they will become hungry. The food supply chain will stop. They'll become hungry, and when they finally become hungry, they're going to start cursing their king. And when they've cursed their king, and that doesn't seem to change anything, and they have no power over the political nature of their country, then they're going to begin to curse God. And they'll curse God, and he says it right here in verse 22. And they will look up to the heaven, they will look up and down the earth, but every place they look, there will be trouble and anguish and dark despair, and they will be thrown out into darkness. And then in chapter 9... God's still trying to get through to Ahaz. And he says, let me tell you again what the truth is going to be out of this whole conspiracy mess. In Isaiah 9, he said, for unto us a child is going to be born. To us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the increase of the government of peace, there will be no end. This is a king who comes and rules with his government that will continue forever and ever. And then God says, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. So 800 years later, the prophecy of hope in Christ Jesus that had been beating in the heart of God clear back here with Ahaz. He, Jesus comes to rescue us. And when he comes to rescue us, he comes to rescue us from ourselves. He comes to rescue us from our sins. He comes to rescue us in our lives from the destruction of the enemy who's seeking to destroy everything in our lives. He's come to save us from the destruction of of Satan. 
Because there are two stories that run through the story of Advent. There are two agendas that are happening in every one of your lives sitting here this morning and those of you that are listening by live stream. There are two agendas. And the first agenda is agenda of destruction. An agenda of distraction. An agenda of division. And there's also then the agenda of abundant life. I want us to look at this abundant life that comes through the birth of Christ, comes through Jesus himself. Jesus said it in John chapter 10. He said, the thief, speaking of the enemy, speaking of Satan, he has come to steal from you. He has come to kill you and take you out. He's come to destroy your future and to make your life miserable before you die. He's come to destroy, kill, and, and steal. But I have come, Jesus said, that you may have life, and not just have life, but have it abundantly. Whether you're aware of it this morning or not, there is this war going on in your life right now. There is this war of agendas. There's this battle going on for your death. There's this battle going on for your destruction. There's this battle going on for your confusion. Because the Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal or abundant life. And there's a conflict going on right now in your lives. You may be aware of it. There's a conflict going on in your life to steal your future, not just your eternal life, but to steal your joy in the circumstances you're living in, that, that to steal your joy right now in your life. And one of the thieves' agenda, the enemy, Satan himself, is in your life. He's seeking to destroy, but Jesus has an agenda to give you life. As we think about that in this Christmas season, Jesus wants all people to experience his agenda of abundant life. He wants you to taste it. He wants you to see it. He wants you to hear it. He wants you to feel it. He wants you to be able to smell it. This abundant life. Well, what is this abundant life? What, what is in, wrapped up in the package of this abundant life? Well, there are three, three ways in which this abundant life Jesus wants to express in your life. That's why he came. That's why he came on the first Christmas. And the first one is this. He has come that you might experience the hope fulfilled in the forgiveness of sins. Forgiveness of sins. You say, Pastor, I've heard that all my life. Yes, you have. But somebody needs to hear it this morning. That Jesus has come to really forgive you. Not, not, just, not just try to ignore it. What you've done in your past. He wants to forgive you. The Apostle Paul was preaching in Acts chapter 13. And one of the first things he said when he got up to speak to the people who were listening. He said, brothers, listen. We are here to proclaim that through this man, Jesus, there is forgiveness for your sins. Everyone believes in him is declared right with God. Something the law of Moses could never do. This is the promise of Emmanuel. God has come in Christ Jesus to be with us so that he can forgive us. Well, how did Jesus do that? How does he know how to forgive? Can you really trust that? Can you really believe that? I mean, here is God up here, and here you are down here. Here is the perfect. Here is the bright light. Here is everything. Here is darkness, and here is you. With all your brokenness and your past and the embarrassment and the shame of your sins. How can, how can this come here and how can you ever get to him? The good news of the Christmas story is found in Hebrews chapter 2. And here the Hebrew writer tells us how that happens. Because God's children, he writes are human beings made of flesh and blood. The Son also became flesh and blood. 
That means that Jesus, who was fully God, had all the God powers, the scripture says, became nothing and counted equality with God, not something to hang on to, but dumped all of his God powers. Dumped all of his God powers. He only kept the character of holy love. <laughs> and he came into the human form and into human flesh, helpless, as Martin Luther says, as a puking baby in a manger. There he is. He became flesh and blood. For only, the Hebrew writer says, a human being could he die, and only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. He came to destroy the power of the de devil. Only in this way could he set free all who have lived their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. Now watch this verse 16 in Hebrews chapter 2. We also know that the Son did not come to help angels. He came to help the descendants of Abraham. It was necessary that he be made in every respect like you, like me, like us, his brothers and sisters, so that he could be our merciful, faithful high priest before God, that he could offer a sacrifice that would take away the sins of the people. And since he himself has gone through the same suffering and testing that you're going through right now, and he's able then, because he's been there, to help us when we are being tested. Notice that word helps that's used three times in that passage of Scripture. It literally means that someone rescues another by taking hold of them and lifting them out of a dangerous situation, much like the father did with his two-year-old daughter who had left the lunch table early and went out in the backyard to the swimming pool and dove in. And when they went to find her, they found her at the bottom of the pool, looking up through the water as if to say, help. And like any dad would do, that dad dove into the pool and grabbed a hold of her and helped her to safety, to help her to life. He did not want her to die in a watery grave. He lifted her out of that and he had noticed it and he saw the frightened look on her face and he makes the salvation available to her. And that's what Jesus did for you and me. He found us in the pool of sin, helpless to break it, helpless to, to, to crack it, help not able to float on it. And we're drowning, looking for help. And Jesus got into the pool of sin. And he grabs a hold of us. And he rescues us from spiritual death. And he rescues us from eternal death. And he goes to the cross. And he becomes not only our helper, but he also becomes our hope fulfilled in the crucifixion. And we are made new because of him. He came to save us. His name is the name above all names. The Bible says there's no other name. There's no other way. There aren't a dozen ways to God. There's only one way to God. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. There is no other name under heaven, anywhere in the universe, by which we can be saved. He rescued us from the pool of sin. And if we'll come and confess our helplessness at the bottom of the sin pool... <laughs> confess our sins. He, the Bible says, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But this abundant life means more than just Jesus helping us out of the sin life in our life. You see, Jesus not only brought the fulfilled hope of forgiveness of sins, he also came to fulfill the hope to free us and put us in a different position to be fulfilled that gives us abundant life because he not only forgives you of your sins, he came that you might have freedom from your sin. 
That's the fulfillment of the hope of Emmanuel. God with us. But watch this. God doesn't only want to be with you. He wants to be in you. The hope of glory. 1 John 3, 8 says, The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. In other words, there's more to abundant life than just forgiveness from your sins. There is this inner power through the Holy Spirit in which He comes to free us from all sin. Because just like the two-year-old girl, as soon as her daddy saved her, and some time had passed, guess where she went back to? The pool. What in the world is she thinking? What does the two-year-old think? Daddy will save me again? What does the two-year-old think? I'm going to jump in, but this time it will be different? Some of us are caught in the loop. The loop of sin. And so we come and confess our sins and He forgives us. But we're no longer, we're, we're, we're no more than forgiven for a very long period of time. And we're back into the pool of sin. And we come again with the forgiveness and God does. He forgives us our sins as we confess them and then we're back in the pool of sin. And we keep living in the cycle in the loop of sin, forgiveness, sin, forgiveness, sin, forgiveness. And some will even preach from the pulpit that this is all we can expect in this life. But the Bible says, and the Christmas story says, no, Jesus did not come so that you could just live in forgiveness. He came so that he could destroy the devil and the works of the devil. And he could free you from your sin. So that you can live in righteousness and holiness. In fact, the scripture makes it really clear. Paul had the same problem in the church of the Romans. And in chapter 6, he, he writes these words. They were saying, let's just live in the loop. That's the best we can expect. Shall we go on? Let's just keep on sinning. So that grace abounds. And Paul says, since you, since, well then, should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace? Of course not. Since you have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? Or have you forgotten that when you were joined with Christ Jesus in your baptism, you were joined in His death? For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism, just as Christ was raised from the dead by His glorious power of the Father. Now also we can live a new life. For when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. So you should consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin and alive to God. Therefore, do not let sin control your bodies any longer. Don't let the body be an instrument of evil to serve sin. And give, give yourselves instead completely to God. For you were dead, but now you have new life. So use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. You are free from the power of sin that leads to to holiness, and the result is abundant or eternal life. Paul wrote to Titus, and he said, For the grace of God has been revealed, bringing salvation to all people, and we are instructed to turn from godless living and sinful pleasures, and we should live in this evil world with wisdom, with righteousness, and devotion to God, while we look forward with hope to the wonderful day when the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ will be revealed. And He gave His life, what? To free us, listen to this, to free us from every kind of sin, to cleanse us and to make us His very own people totally committed to doing good deeds. I remember as a young man struggling with incredible temptation in my life. And I came across that very verse. And I took that verse and I wrote it not only in my journal, but I wrote it on a card and I carried it in my shirt pocket. And under great testing and temptation, I would pull that out and it would say to me, He has come to set you free from every kind of sin and to cleanse you 
you have the power through His Spirit. That's the wonder of the hope fulfilled in Jesus Christ. It is coming as a babe in the manger, not only to bring you forgiveness for your past sins, <laughs> but to set you free from your sin so that God is not only with you, but He is living in you. Christ, the hope of glory, in you by His Holy Spirit who cleanses you from all sin. But there's one other way that abundant life is lived out. The gift is unwrapped in the coming of Jesus Christ. And that is that when Jesus came, there was the fulfilled hope that you could have a future that has focus and direction in your life. The enemy can no longer steal your future when you're in Christ. Listen to Romans chapter 15 when Paul wrote, I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace. Why? Because you trust in Him. Then you'll overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. This was the problem of King Ahaz. King Ahaz could not see his future. He was living with a divided heart. He was listening to many voices. He was, he, he was caught up in the dilemma. He was under pressure. He was facing all of his enemies. And he had to come to a crisis that everyone in this room and everyone listening to my voice has to come to in the dilemmas of your life. You have to decide in the dilemmas of your life where are you going to seek your help from and who are you going to trust in your life? There's a crossroads. For Ahaz, it was, well, are you going to trust your military strategists? Are you going to trust your political advisors? They were telling him one thing. Are you going to trust the strategy? Are you going to trust the experts? My daddy used to say, you know what an expert is? <laughs> it's a drip under pressure. <laughs> expert. Think about it. And he had to decide, am I going to trust those around me? And the, and the clear message was, don't listen. Don't listen. If you go back to chapter 8 there, don't listen to the conspiracy theories. Don't listen to what everybody else is thinking and saying. Listen to the voice of God in your life. Don't listen to the saints. Don't go praying to the saints and checking your horoscope and, and getting your fortune tell, told. Trust me. That's your hope. As a young man, again, there was a verse that God put in my life as a teenager. I even wrote a song to it. It's... It's not just a verse. In fact, if you get a graduation card for me or you get a card from me that talks about your future, I'll always put Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. It's not just a verse to me. It's been my life verse. It says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart and do not lean to your own understanding. Well, that's so easy to do, isn't it? Because we're smart people, aren't we? We're studied people. We're educated people. We know what the facts are. We, you can't fool us very much. Don't lean unto your own understanding. But it goes ahead to say, Seek me in everything you do. Seek my will. And here's what he says. God doesn't say, I might show up. He doesn't say, well, if you, if, if you act good enough, I might show up. He says, if you will seek me and trust me, I will show you which path you need to take in the dilemmas and the decisions that you're facing right now. I've hung on to that verse. Boy, have I ever needed that. I've had times across these years of ministry where I had a decision to make and I had a hundred voices speaking in my life. I was getting the mail and the email. 
I was called every name under the sun. I, I was told, given all kinds of warnings. I was given all kinds of threats. You better do this, pastor. You better do that, pastor. And I had to say to, to, to my closet, I had to go back to this person and say, okay, Lord, what's the truth? Who do I believe? I've had to sit in front of Twitter and Facebook and news channels and hear what everybody's saying about everything and then turn to the Lord and say, Lord, how in the world do we know what the truth is? You've got to help me. What is the truth behind all of that? What's the truth? Well, but it was so and so talking and you believe it. No, no. What's the truth? And I've heard the voice of the Lord say, don't you think like everybody else thinks. And don't you go in the direction that everybody else is going. I will guide your paths if you'll listen to me. Do you think I was scared? Yeah, I was shaken like a leaf. Like a tree in a storm. And I'm thinking, here's the test. I'm done if you don't come through. I remember a particular time out of the many stories I could tell. A few some years ago, we were trying to find a building for the church. And I found myself in the home of a landlord who wanted to sell us his building. And we would have bought it, we would have taken it. But he wanted to sell it to me for a whole lot more than it was worth. And he wanted to sell it because he was upside down in it. And so the broker who was working with us, and she and I went and sat in his beautiful, lavish office that was in his home here in the area. And he sat down and he, he talked to us a little bit. He said, let me show you my house. And at the time, it, it, it had all the newest bells and whistles. I mean, it had the automatic, well-positioned, five or six shower head. I mean, I was in his shower. He was showing me his shower. I felt a little awkward. Michelle there, he's there. We're all in the shower. He showed me a special stash, a special refrigerator that gave automatic, brought out special drinks and all this kind of stuff. And, and the lighting was just impeccable. Everything was automated and automatic and lit up and turned colors and did all the stuff that now it's just kind of commonplace in a lot of our homes. But it was pretty, pretty big deal then. And we oohed and we awed, and it was such a, uh, what a tour. And then Michelle and I went back to his office and sat down. And he looked at me and he said, Reverend, I could make you a lot of money. Your people would be proud of you. I could make you a lot of money and put your church on the map. You wouldn't have to struggle ever again. If you just do what I tell you to do, we can help you out here. And I had the opportunity to share my hope in Christ Jesus. And I called him by name and I said, but you don't understand. We don't operate on that kind of thinking. We operate on the basis of giving, tithing, sacrificial giving of God's people. We don't come like they do at your church. Come to your door every year or call you up on the phone and say, how much are you good for this year? You better belly it up. And he looked at me a little strange like, I said, we don't go around pressuring our people to give. I said, we allow God to work in their hearts. And he looked at me like he had never heard that before in his life. And I began to tell him what the mission of, of, of it reaching and nurturing seekers to become fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. And how God provides for his church. And he stood and looked at me. So he gave up on me. He decided that I wasn't going to work. So he turns to Michelle, the broker. And he says, you know, if you could talk them into this, I could make you a fat commission. And I'll never forget Michelle's response. She looked at him and she said, well, you could, but there's only one problem with that. I'm not paid on commission. I work for a broker who pays me a flat salary. I don't work for commission. And I could see his face drop. You know, it would have been easy. The temptation was great. 
He was a mover and shaker in the community. He had everything I, I needed and wanted. <laughs> he, had, he, he knew the way around town. He knew who to talk to, what to do. And I came back to this verse. Lord, what's the truth? Is this the guy? <laughs> well, it turned out it wasn't. And so now I was shaken like a leaf in a tree because literally I can still feel when I think about it the stress in my body around Thanksgiving at this particular, this very time of year. I, I still think about the stress I went through for three or four weeks. I felt it physically because I didn't know if I was going to walk over to the building and they were going to change the locks. Because we were in there as a sublease in this building. And we didn't know if, if, if they were going to change the locks. And I'd show up Sunday morning and we couldn't worship there no more. And at the very nick of time, God used Michelle to locate a building. We went to look at it. It was perfect for what we needed at that particular time in our life. And literally in a cold day in January, we, we, we went to move out of the building. We hadn't even told the landlord because we were afraid what he'd do. In fact, one Sunday, I'm telling the people we're moving, and about that time, one of, I don't remember who it was, one of, the, one of the ushers came into the back of the sanctuary and, and, and said, well, I'm standing giving this announcement, and he goes, <laughs> and I'm thinking, what in the world? And he's pointing out the door. The owner had decided to show up with, with some contractors that day. I shut, cut short the announcement. But we showed up to move out. And I unlock the door and I'm moving the first carts. Some of you tried to forget those. We still have a couple of those around. I was moving the first cart when guess who walked in the door? The landlord. What are you doing? I said, well, we were about to call you, but we're moving out today. He said, well, that's interesting because I'm just bringing in the contractors to start gutting the whole thing and remodeling this whole thing for the future. He hadn't even told us. On the very day, and I'll never forget it because it started snowing. And before we were loaded up, there was 10 inches of snow on the ground. And they had quit doing snow removal on that particular property because the original release had, had determinated. And the plow, literally Don Williams brought his truck in with a plow and plowed us out a path in 10 inches of snow. It was the parting of the Red Sea as far as I'm concerned. And we drove that truck and trailer through the path across the parking lot and out to the street literally on the same day that we were getting kicked out. And God put us in a building for five years that met our needs. Trust in the Lord. You say, you, I can remember the stress. Shaking like a leaf. Lord, now what? Why didn't you take up Mr has it all, know it all, who could have helped you out of this mess. But no, God had another way. And I want to say to you this morning, some of you sitting in this room are facing some decisions. You're facing some dilemmas. You don't know what to do. You've called all your friends up. You've listened to all the expert reports. You've done all the Google searches and you've tallied it up on a spreadsheet. I want to ask you this morning. Have you ever put down your pencil and shoved your keyboard away and said, God of heaven, what's the truth? And what do you want me to do? And then wait. That's the hope. And he says it in his word. If you'll trust him. And not just lean on your own understanding. He will. And I'm here to tell you this morning. He will. He's never failed me yet. When I needed him at the desperate moment. And a hundred voices were calling me everything but righteous. He's never failed me. And I've learned. To trust his voice. Well, how do you know it's his voice, Pastor? How do you know? Well, you won't know if you don't stop and wait. 
If you're going to lean on your own understanding, God can bring a dozen signs like he did to Ahaz. And he can come in gentleness of a, as a peaceful river, but you won't get it. Until you're tuned in to the voice of God. And then when you know and you sense and he puts something in you and he becomes not the God with you, but he becomes the God in you. And Jesus said, when I come, I'll be in you. And the Holy Spirit is the one who will guide you in everything that you're to do. He will guide you to the truth. You'll find out what the truth is when there's no other way to find it. You'll know what the truth is and he will guide you to the truth that will set you free. And when you know it, you can stand in the midst of pressure like you've never experienced in your life and know with confident hope that God has spoken and this is the way we're going to go and this is what I need to do and let whatever else takes place, this is where we're going and we're focused and He directs our paths. In a moment, we're going to sing a closing song. I'm going to invite you to act on this this morning. In this Christmas season, right at the beginning, you're facing dilemmas. And over here at this side of the altar is some post-it notes, and some pens. And what we're singing this morning, you know what you're facing right now. You know the decisions you've got to make at some point. You've got some dilemmas. You don't know whether to do this or to do this. You don't know what's the right way to go. You've got everybody giving you expert advice. But you don't know. You're not sure who to trust. I'm going to invite you this morning as we're singing just to get up from where you're at. As an act of faith. As a symbol of faith. As a, as, as a sign of faith. And come and take a pen and write the dilemma on a post. And now you say, I don't want to do that because somebody might read it. Yeah, so put it in code. I've got journals full of code. Because <laughs> I didn't want anybody reading some of my journals. And especially sometimes in my life what I was struggling with and working through. I didn't want nobody to know. So write it in code. I don't know. Pig Latin. So you don't even know what that is. Write it in a code. Write it in a different language. Just write it on a post-it note. The point is not what you write. The point is you do it. Take the post-it note, and I want you to take it over and paste it, poke it anywhere you want to on the nativity scene over here to my left. And by doing that, saying, Lord, my trust is in you, the hope of glory. It may be that you're coming this morning and, and you're coming needing forgiveness of sins. Well, let Him forgive you. Receive it. It's the gift. Maybe this morning you say, I've been in the loop. That, Pastor, that's my life right there. That's my life. I just live in this loop. But you want to come this morning and say, Holy Spirit of God, do for me what I cannot do for myself. Cleanse me. Changing my desires. I don't want to keep going and diving into the sin pool all the time. I want to be forgiven and I want to be cleansed and I want to live in victory in the power of your Holy Spirit. And you just come to Him this morning and you can write it there and just put it over there. Here's what I'm going to do with it. I'll collect them at the end. They're not going to stay there. I'm going to collect them and they'll become my personal prayer. Journal time in this Advent season. And I'll be praying for you that God will direct your paths. Because you know what would be the wonderful thing? I'd love to have it happen. I've got one that I'm, I can hardly wait to January now. Because in January, I'd like to hear some testimonies. I'd like for some testimonies to be shared about some dilemmas that God has led you through. And I've already got one that agreed to do it in January. We're going to do a series. I'm going to talk about that. And I'd love for God to have done something in these 30 days of Advent that forever changes your life. It blows your 
mind of what he's done with the situation you're facing right now. Would you let him do that this morning? Let's sing together. You come and bring your note in an act of faith and put it on the nativity scene as a sign of faith and the hope in the Christ who is in you.